pleased to follow on from Andy and Elvira because um, yeah, I'm going to sing from the same sheet, uh, the importance of long-term data. Uh, on the Froom, we've been um, monitoring a population of salmon for uh, since the 70s, um, but we've been had a pit tag program in place since um, 2002, 2003, which allows us to look at individual data, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, yeah, I'm very pleased to be here to present this, and I'm also very pleased that my results um, basically say what's in my abstract, which I wrote some months before. So anyway, let's press on quickly. So we'll talk a little, and just a quick overview of the salmon life cycle. It's an anadromous fish, uh, it has a freshwater and a marine phase, as you can see from this life cycle um, sketch here. We, in this, uh, in this life cycle, I sort of break it down, I think we all break it down to three major transitions. We've got a, an egg to smolt phase uh, up here, the freshwater phase, which is the, the freshwater phase here. And then we have a, a marine phase, this is our smolt going out to sea, they spend some time in the, in, in the marine environment and the, where they mature, uh, sorry, mature and, and grow and feed to come back as adults at, the, um, at this stage here where they re-enter the rivers uh, to spawn. And this, uh, this is associated with three major types of survival or mortality. We've got fresh mortal, more, freshwater mortality in this, or survival in this stage, we've got marine survival here and we've got fishing mortality here. And in this talk, I'm going to focus entirely on the marine phase and its link to the freshwater um, ecosystem. So, what do we know about this phase? Um, I'm very pleased to follow on from um, Andy, and I'm going to need to talk to Andy a little bit more because I've done a lot of digging um, in the literature for information on what affects uh, smolt survival in the marine environment, and I haven't found a huge amount. Uh, I think I've come up with some of the same risks as Andy did. There's physiological stress of moving from the fresh water to the salt water environment. Uh, it's, you've got temperature plays in that as well as sal uh, salinity. You've got a novel and abundant predators that these smolt won't be used to when they hit the marine environment. They will uh, likely, they're just of a, of a good size for, for many bird and uh, fish uh, predators. Um, and of course, there's also distant water fisheries. Once they get out into the into the open seas, they they are or have been in the past subject to to fisheries as well. But that's now fairly highly regulated. So, what do we think is marine survival is related to? Well, there's a there's a feeling, and but again, I haven't found a great deal of hard evidence for this that smolt length is a good correlate of the probability to return as, a, as an adult or, or let's say marine survival. Uh, the origin of your fish, whether it's a wild fish or a hatchery fish, may also affect its ability to survive at sea. And of course the environmental conditions that they, that they uh, encounter when they get to sea and spend time at sea. So this idea that sea surface temperature growth conditions when they hit the sea could be very important for their survival as well. So I didn't find a huge amount of evidence to suggest that uh, and not a lot of hard evidence to suggest that, that length was a good predictor of marine survival. So I thought that that's perhaps something that we might be able to answer at least with our pit tag data on the Froom. As I say, it's a program that's been going since 2002. We don't get a huge number of returning adults, but we do get a good number. And that provides us with individual information. Uh, the program is set up, so I'll just quickly run over it. So we, we, uh, we tag uh, juveniles in September. Uh, to about 10,000 juveniles if we can, this is salmon, uh, around the Froome catchment, they then return to the river, they have their overwinter period, then they smolt in spring generally, um, and we capture them in a, a rotary screw trap, or we capture a selection of them, in a, a sample of them in the rotary screw trap, we measure them, take biometric information, we release them back and they carry on on their merry way to sea, and then of course they go off to sea and whatever happens to them happens to them, they come back into the fresh water to spawn, and then we have a chance to see those individuals again. So that's the advantage of having this, this, these pit tags, is we are following those individuals right from the time when we mark them in September through to their return to the, to the fresh water to spawn. So the question here, using those data, was does marine survival increase with increasing smolt length? And we can address this not just with the population level, but we can look at individuals. So our prediction was that uh, marine survival estimates from a model will increase with smolt length. So how do we go about looking at this? So first of all, we have to estimate marine survival. 
we decided to do this using a Bayesian state space model. It uh, enables us to uh, look at the capture histories of the individuals uh, and we account for their, uh, the states that they're seen in uh, and the fact that our, our system to detect them is imperfect. So that's why we went with this model, but I'll talk a little more about that. But we've not just using it to estimate marine survival, as that's been done before, but what we're interested to do is describe what the correlates of marine survival are. So we're, we're going, to, going to adapt this Bayesian state space model to estimate the effects of individual smolt length on their probability to survive. Um, and then this is something I have written in my abstract, which I haven't done, so this is a to-do, uh, is to consider alternative hypotheses. For example, sea surface temperature, those growth conditions they, they, they encounter at sea, how, what, are the, what is the role of, of those conditions in, in, uh, in, in describing uh, patterns in marine survival. So Bayesian state space model is, is actually fairly straightforward. We have a, two matrices. We have a, a state matrix and a space matrix. So here we've got Z is our state matrix. We've got states A, B, and we've got an unknown state, question mark. We've got a space matrix of individual for individual I as well. And this is basically an observation matrix. So we saw it at time one and we saw it at time three, but we didn't see it at time two and four. So if you were to read these two matrices for individual I, you would say it was observed in state K, which was actually state A, at time one. It was then unobserved at time two. It was observed in state B at time three, and it was unobserved at time four. And so it uses these information for many individuals to learn something about the probability that a fish is seen and the probability that if it is seen, in what state was it? And what I mean by state is like whether it was seen on a particular, in a particular location. So that might be uh, our first pit tag reader might be A, our second might be B, and there might be a C and a D pit tag reader as well. So um, it's an individual-based Bayesian state space model that allows us to admit individual smolt length. That was very important. This is the adaptation bit that I was talking about, but it also assimilates information to the stock level. So we talk, uh, and so what we have here is our smolt going, uh, becoming spawners, and we have here, this is marine mortality, and we can have various things feeding into marine mortality, or predicting marine mortality, and they can be parameterized at the individual level, they can be parameterized at the population level, we have length here which is measured for each eye, and we have T which is the other plate here if you like, so we're doing this over time as well for various time periods. So. First of all, I wanted to test whether this worked. Um, to do that, we generate data and we estimate parameters from the same model. It's a fairly straightforward way to do it. You, know, you want to have confidence that you can detect a change if there is a change. So we uh, use the model both to generate data and then fit back to it to see if we get what we, ex what we use to generate it. So we have a table of generating parameters. We haven't got many parameters in this model. We've got marine survival. We've got the probability of release uh, de uh, detection at release, which is one. We always see them when we drop them in. Uh, we have the detection at our main detection station as a returning adult, and then we have a detection between, uh, we have, there's about three kilometers in the river between our detection sites, and so we we're assuming that there is a, uh, no loss during that, in that three kilometers as well. So using those generating parameters, if we put them into the model to generate some time series and fit back to it, lo and behold, nicely we get pretty much what we want. In this case we've got, um, uh, sorry I, said, I should have said here, I'm using two cases, I'm testing this, I've tested it extensively but I'm just presenting a couple of cases. Here is where we've got a high marine survival of 70% and a low marine survival of just 5%. And what we find for the high marine survival case if we fit the model back to the generator, the data that we generate from it, we pretty much get back on our values which is what we hope to do and the confidence intervals are fairly slim around those estimates. This is just demonstrating that this Bayesian state space model works for the simple case. Um, for those that know a bit of Bayesian state space modeling, it, it, all the diagnostics look good. We're looking for basically a mess of three chains here. They're completely into, intermixing, which is good. And our posteriors are all overlapping and fairly tight as well. So this is nice. If we test it with the low case, so we've got low marine survival. Again, we managed to estimate it quite well. We've got a bit of a wider confidence interval around our uh, probability of detecting it at our first pit tag site, so, but that's not entirely unexpected because we've got um, sparse data now. 
But what we wanted to really do now is to adapt this Bayesian state space model to include the, uh, the effect of individual smolt length. Uh, to do that, we're going to use a straightforward logistic regression. Um, and we're going to have uh, just an alpha parameter and a beta parameter. And alpha is just your, your sort of the individual effect. And then the beta we're using uh, as a, this the slope of the effect of, um, uh, of length on the probability to survive. So this is just simulated data and a, and a line fit. We're looking for something like that, some sort of sigmoidal um, uh, curve like this. So again, I uh, adapted the model and wanted to test it with, these new, with this new uh, parameterization, including individual length. And the new parameters we have here are alpha and beta for our logistic regression. And I tried those at a fixed case, but they work for a variety of different va uh, values. Again, we've got a high case and a low case. And what we find is we're not bad. We're not brilliant, but we're not bad. We seem to be, we seem to be hitting pretty close to the mark um, for the marine survival. And this is marine mor mortality, which is just one minus marine survival. And our probability of detecting them is pretty good as well. Our regression parameters are a little less certain, but logistic regression is quite unstable. So this is not entirely unexpected either. But it's not doing too badly. When we pull out the actual prediction, we see a, sig a slight sigmoid sigmoidal curve. We've got the, the actual values in black, and the, the estimated ones are in red. So we're not doing too badly. Again, all the diagnostics fit fine. And with the low case, the low marine survival case, we've got a similar situation. We're getting pretty close to our generating parameters in all cases. So it's, it's encouraging. It's not perfect, but it's encouraging. So there is a little more to do. Oh, sorry, there's the, uh, there's the fit for the predict predicted effect as well. So there's a little more to do. Maybe I will need to look at how we're specifying alpha and beta a little bit better, see if we can get some tighter confidence intervals around those estimates. And I might like to treat alpha as a ra random variable to allow individual, it's a basically a random effect where you have individual effects taken account for. And I want to do a little bit more testing. So it's, it's pretty good, but it's not perfect. But I thought I'd try it with some of the salmon data for the Froom anyway. So what do we know about the Froom? It's a chalk stream. Uh, we, it's a wild salmon population. 98% uh, of our smolts leave at age one. Uh, th this model is only using those 98% and uh, because the remaining smolts, the S2s, and we very, very rarely see an S3, but uh, the S2s constitute such a small number of fish that we very rarely see them come back as adults. So it's very difficult to work with those data. Uh, and we have pit tag data. It's worth saying here, following on from um, Elvira and Andy's talks, that our uh, age of smolts doesn't seem to be changing. It seems to be pretty constant as well. And so we have a, actually a very simple system here with the Froom. It's quite nice to test this. So we've had a pit tagging program in place annually since 2003 to present. I said 2002, that's when we started it, but that first year was a bit of a, a, bit of a trial period. So it covers the entire Froom catchment. We aim to distribute 10,000 pit tags a year, and we have pit tag readers throughout the catchment. Um, the sample size for this analysis was around 8,500 pit tag smolts, of which 190 were seen returning as adults during that period. Um, obviously, the, you know, the smolts go out, uh, and they come back a year or two later. So we took, with data we're actually analyzing, I think, goes back to 2006 for the returning adults. And this is the estimates that we get for when we fit this model, the length model for the Froom data. We get a very low marine survival uh, and a correspondingly high marine mortality. We've got a probability estimate for, uh, of detection at our main pit tag site. And we've got reasonable estimates of our regression coefficients. But let's talk a little bit more about those. So we currently use a, a Chapman capture mark recapture model um, to look at uh, annual m mortality each year um, and this sort of integrates all of that information so what I wanted to see was that our Chapman model of the data that we've been reporting for years this basically reflected that um, because it's much the same model but just fit in a different way and it does um, what we find is our Marine survival for the Froome Atlantic salmon, the Chapman model, um, because it's annually, there's a range here. It's between 1.8 and 2.5% marine survival, sometimes a little higher. And this BSM estimates that. It's taking all years together, but I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, it estimates this marine survival to be about 2.3%. So that's, uh, by and large, reflects what we, what we expected to see. 
The pit reader detection probability estimate, uh, again from our Chapman model, we've estimated that to be about 0.85, and this, uh, this BSM, BSSM comes up with 0.84. So pretty, pretty good. I'm fairly happy that this Bayesian approach uh, is, is basically emulating and doing pretty much what the, the Chapman model is also doing. But what about that length, effective length? Well, there's our curve from zero to one, marine survival on the x axis, on the y axis there, to covering the full range of probabil uh, probability of survival. And obviously, this is pretty meaningless, so let's change the axis. And when we change the axis, because we've got a very low marine survival of, uh, in, uh, in, in the Froome, we see there is a little bit of an effect of length on the probability to return as, a, as an adult. And the parameter estimates for the logistic regression, we've got this uh, parameter estimate for alpha. At the moment, this is just a single parameter for all fish. I plan to make that a, 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 an individual parameter. But this is the one of interest. This is the effect of smolt, uh, smolt length on their probability to, uh, to return as an adult. And what we find is, is, albeit small, there is an effect, and it's away from zero. So I would say that we have a, we have a weak but positive effect of length on the probability to return as, a, as an adult. So what do I conclude from this so far? That our, this Bayesian state space model approach seems to work quite well, uh, and it allows us to account for imperfect detection without having to do any sort of measurements. We just measure, we estimate that from the data. It admits individual length information, and it also allows, it will allow for other covariates, such as sea surface temperature. Uh, and we also find Although it's a bit provisional, a bit preliminary, I would say that uh, salmon smolts uh, on the Froom, their marine survival does appear at least to be weakly affected by their length as they leave. So the implications of this so far are that we have recently published a paper showing that salmon par are shrinking on the Froom, the Wire and the Scorf. Wire and the Scorf are in France. This is a plot of uh, fork length of par measured over time, and we can see a decreasing trend on all three of those rivers, and this is, these are based on very large samples of fish. So we're quite confident that we're seeing a shrinking in salmon par, and if they're shrinking, and we've seen actually on the, on the Froome that the smolts are shrinking as well, though I've not really looked at it in any great detail, but that's gonna be the next thing to do, there may well be implications for these shrinking smolt or, or, or juvenile sizes for their marine survival. So a little look at what, you know, the sort of weak effect we're looking at. This is just the, the raw data thrown. There's no, it's not stratified in any way here. We've just got those uh, smolts that were observed coming back and those that were not observed. This doesn't account for imperfect detection. And just a log 10 of their length. And we can see there's ever such a slightly higher median in those that come back compared to those that don't or that we see come back compared to those we don't see again. But it'd be interesting now maybe to stratify that by year. You can see that there are some years where that effect appears to be a bit greater. Uh, it looks to me as though that year might also be based on a fairly small sample of returning fish, but nevertheless, um, it sh it should still, we should still perhaps try and account for this uh, interannual variation in return rates. So the next steps are to extend this model to uh, estimate marine survival for separate years. Maybe to extend it to estimate one sea winter and multi sea winter survival separately. That's something that we're along the path to doing already. And we also want to compare models including additional explanatory variables. This is part three that I mentioned, considering alternate hypotheses to explain variation in marine survival. Um, things such as sea surface temperature and growth conditions. And that's really very easily done in this sort of framework just by adding extra parameters to the logistic regression. So here we have the, we had the simple one with just alpha and beta and length, and now we just add another beta and sea surface temperature and so on and so on. So it's quite an adaptable framework. And that's it, I think.